Um, good. So uh, my name is Shayan Ghosh, uh, and uh, a lot of this work it was done by Yan Kang, who is a graduate student at Pennsylvania State, uh, working uh, with Mahmoud Kandemir. So I'd like to acknowledge him. And uh, the work is about graph analytics, which is an irregular um, kind of application area, especially the impact of right allocate elimination, which I will explain. Um, so basically the motivation is that, you know, memory write operations first need to read data from memory into the cache. And uh, that is what I try to highlight here, if I can only, okay, my laser pointer. Okay, probably you can see my, okay, there you go. So uh, this is a, a, a cartoon that shows what happens. So when you have an A equal to B type of operations, where, operation where A is being written into. So, uh, you know, there is always a write miss that happens. And then the cache line is allocated before a copy from memory is made. And as you can imagine with the, uh, you know, the, uh, the more memory accesses that you have, um, it can cost you like hundreds of nanoseconds and that can add up to the application costs. So the point is that in this type of operations where uh, something is getting written, so the cache line is going to be overwritten anyway. So what is the point of uh, the read? So uh, the question is that how can we get rid of this spurious uh, read operation? What would it take? How would you alter the applications? And uh, will it improve the performance of applications? And if so, by how much? So first, let's talk a little bit about write allocate elimination. So basically, as I said that, you know, before uh, this is the requirement to make write possible, you must assign like a cache line, it might be write true and then you know, bring the data into the caches. And um, so that is right allocate. And then you have two options. One is evasion and the other one is elimination. So evasion is when the hardware detects that the cache line is going to be overwritten. So the option is that instead of using a cache, store the cache line, you know, it store the cache line directly in memory. And that's what, um, you know, Intel architecture, some of the Intel architectures, which uses non-temporal stores uh, does. Uh, there are some compiler hints, so nothing is guaranteed. Um, and then the newer Intel machines like uh, Intel Icelake has this spec I2M, which automatically detects, uh, you know, uh, where, uh, you know, non-temporal stores could happen um, and, and uh, makes uh, adjustments. And then you have the option of elimination. So in, in that case, you directly write a cache line uh, with zeros and the processor loads the cache line. So, uh, you know, it only deals with the cache line and it can avoid the memory uh, read. And in Fujitsu A64FX, there is an option of doing this type of, uh, you know, uh, allocating a cache line and then, uh, you know, uh, zero filling it uh, and thereby avoiding uh, the memory read through a special instruction called DCZVA. And you can read more about, uh, you know, uh, these several options in uh, Dr. George Heger's uh, blog post. Uh, so, uh, just to explain a little bit, so this is a, you know, uh, this is a cartoon, um, and each block here is, uh, it, it, you know, is some sort of a, uh, is some sort of memory. So you have registers, which is fast memory, and then L1 and L2, and then finally main memory, and the door represents the memory accesses. So let's say that you have the same A equal to B example. So how, how does the zero fill work? So Basically, you know, the zero fill on um, is at the L2 cache level. So upon receiving a uh, specific instruction, the L2 cache, uh, you know, it will secure a line corresponding to the virtual address and it will write it with zero data. And then the on L1 cache, the zero data will be uh, written after the um, in the L1 after the cache line is written back to the uh, to L2, and so 
in this diagram, the top level, the top part is without Z fill, and the bottom part is with Z fill. So overall, you can see that it, you know, it avoids one memory access. Um, so uh, so that can actually, uh, you know, uh, lead to some interesting optimizations. So saving the memory traffic means improving memory bandwidth and instantly what benchmark comes to your mind for studying sustainable mem main memory bandwidth so of course it's stream right so uh, you know so we are we we want to see that what would be the impact on stream and although we know that it oversimplifies application use cases application scenarios it would be interesting to see how better stream can get when you apply uh, ZFIL. But um, I, at the lab, uh, you know, I deal with irregular use cases where, uh, you know, typically the data is unstructured and in the form of a graph. And then we have to perform some analytics. And these type of operations involving graphs, they are actually you know, quite uh, difficult to scale. And uh, some of them have zero flops even. So it's all repetitive memory accesses. So basically stream is a best case memory bandwidth benchmark, very useful, but we want to know for irregular use cases, what would be the performance improvement? Um, so as it does not represent irregular cases. So one observation from graph analytics is that, so this is a cartoon that shows typical contiguous access, nothing to see here, one after the other, the stride is like, you know, fixed strides. But uh, here for graphs, uh, you usually have a specific data representation, which is called compressed sparse row, it can be you know, compressed sparse column, it can be block, blocked compressed sparse row, etc. There are other formats available as well, but CSR is one of the most common. So, uh, you know, you have this dual uh, nested loop where you have, um, you know, the, there is this row pointer, which is pointing to this column index uh, array. And as you can imagine, seeing from this, um, you know, fig, uh, seeing this cartoon, that these trip counts, these are not, uh, you know, uh, the loop trip counts are, it, it's not fixed. It, it depends on the structure of the graph. So these arrows that are, you know, pointing to the start and end locations, they will change with the graph that you supply. And that's one problem with graph analytics, that there is no one single, you know, graph, one single graph that is the field representative. So we worked on, uh, so we wanted to actually, you know, have uh, something as simple as stream, but at the same time, a uh, benchmark that kind of expresses this type of graph, um, you know, memory accesses. And what we observed is that, you know, in, you know, a variety of graph applications, they perform this neighborhood access, which is like for every vertex, uh, check all the neighbors of the vertex and do something. So, this is kind of the main loop structure. And we thought that perhaps we can devise a simple benchmark and uh, like, you know, which would, which would be sort of representative of, of uh, you know, of the of variety of uh, graph applications, but at the same time will hold properties. We can use the properties of stream like, uh, and, 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 uh, uh, there are variations, of course, significant variations, because in stream, as you can remember, there is only one loop, but here there are two loops. But however, uh, when we ac actually did the, uh, when we did some uh, metrics analysis, we saw that the properties are not that different if you use similar sized graphs. Um, so we kind of uh, decided to uh, go with it and um, and 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 kind of use this benchmark to study graph analytics use cases or variety of graph analytics use cases. So one thing to remember is that uh, you know it can also return uh, bandwidth, just like stream. So so you know so we can use units that we understand. So how does one um, actually implement uh, or, or 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 exploit zero filling? So 
if you have to, um, as it turns out, that if you have to enable the explicit zero fill formulation, you have to use explicit assembly. There are other options, I'll come to it. Um, so basically two things, you have to um, invoke explicit assembly. And secondly, you need to uh, restructure your loops. And uh, you know, uh, so this is a small uh, code snippet, which actually shows the same, um, you know, uh, same dual nested loop uh, for, for for every vertex, uh, you know, check all the edges and do something, uh, that pattern. And uh, we had to kind of change, uh, restructure the loop a little bit. So I have actually segregated each of the important pieces. So um, we are in OpenMP domain. So each thread will work on fixed chunk of iterations over the number of vertices. And there will be a loop blocking. Uh, of the outermost loop. And the idea is to invoke zero fill in strides larger than the L2 prefetch distance. Otherwise, you know, um, you know, so, so sufficiently large, uh, but not too large. Uh, so, and then there will be the inner loop of over edges where uh, the Z fill will be invoked several times. And this is where it gets tricky because the tri trip count is kind of unknown. Um, so uh, you can instantly imagine that for some graphs, which has, let's say, very fixed structure, very nice structure, all the vertices have same number of uh, edges as neighbors, um, the performance might be more, uh, you know, uh, more, more, uh, uh, it, it might be better in those cases, but if it is super irregular, then there will be some variations. And that is what we expected. So uh, aside from stream and our graph benchmark, which we call as NEV, uh, we also try to actually implement uh, the same strategy on several other graph benchmarks that are available. So GAP is a very popular graph benchmark. Uh, it was originally uh, developed by St Scott Beamer. And, uh, and, and it's like, it's, it, it's still used in evaluations. Although there's been some criticism lately about like, you know, some of the implementations, but I would still say that it is, it tries to capture uh, a large number of important graph kernels. So we decided to use the GAP benchmark. And then we also, um, you know, we had to update the GAP benchmark to, to restructure the loops. And uh, also we had a graph clustering code that we uh, developed uh, to exploit ZFIL. And we also used graph 500 uh, and and we use the graph benchmark. So the, the, the question to ask is that, how representative is that benchmark, uh, you know, when you compare it with applications? So, so after a bit of thought, I think I can say that the applications either represent the graph pattern or the stream pattern. Um, and that is because most of the applications, aside from what they are doing, there are a lot of helper kernels or important kernels that are not directly part of the application, but they are important. Like for instance, I'll give you an example for a graph analytics use case. So no matter, you know, uh, let's consider an arbitrary graph application. So for graphs, um, you know, uh, uh, knowing the total degree of uh, like knowing the total de degree, meaning how many neighbors uh, a particular vertex is connected to can be important. And if the graph is changing, you need to invoke this kernel multiple times to compute the degree. So this falls into the category of, into the, into the pattern of for every vertex, check all the edges and do something. So that's why I think that there are a lot of like, you know, helper functions where ZFIL can be applied readily. And that's what we want we were trying to figure out because otherwise it would take a lot of time to, uh, you know, uh, disentangle codes and, uh, you know, change the structure entirely. So, uh, you know, so we came up with a few application scenarios and found uh, them and found that there were some portions which resembled either stream operations or uh, the graph uh, kernel that we developed. So, 
first of all, how is Stream doing with uh, ZFIL? Now, this is not new. It's doing well with ZFIL, but I think you have seen present representations from ARM um, that, you know, what they did to make uh, Stream, uh, you know, uh, work faster. But typically, Typically, it's like anywhere from 20 to up to 70 percent. So Fujitsu, um, you know, demonstrates improvement of up to 70 percent, which is uh, superb. So red is good. Red means how much improvement, um, you know, ZFIL brought. Um, so, you know, uh, so and Fujitsu also has this compiler option. Uh, um, this is only available for Fujitsu compiler that you can pass this KZ fill compiler option and automatically, um, you know, it will implement uh, DCZVA wherever it thinks is appropriate. And it also works pretty well for stream, but it does not work for C++ cases. So I, I think the C++ compiler cannot make use of ZFIL. Um, and it also does not work for relatively complicated cases. That is what we observed. But so far, so good. For the best case, we see a very good performance improvement, uh, 20 to 70 percent, huge gap. But how does it fare when you try to use your, um, you know, our graph analytics uh, use cases. So first of all, the graph benchmark. So, and, I, and, and as I said, the important thing is to use different graphs because otherwise your, uh, you know, your, your measurements might be biased. So here you, on the X axis, there are um, different graphs and performances on three different kernels, copy, add, and max, which is similar to uh, stream. And on the Y axis, you have the mean, uh, you know, gigabyte per second. And as I said, red means better. Uh, you know, wherever you see red, it means that ZFIL adding ZFIL makes sort of sense. It may not make sense if it is only 1% or 2%, but you know, more than 10%, it's good. So basically we tried different graphs and uh, which implies different structure and, you know, work uh, per uh, loop and uh, we, Notice degradation of 28%, but also 90% improvement with FCC, which is like an outlier, and we have to figure out why. Um, and also we noticed for the add kernel, and this, this was something we noticed with stream as well, uh, the uh, Fujitsu is not doing that well. Uh, it, it leads to more memory writes. And what we figured out upon doing instruction analysis is that there are three extra instructions to perform you know, per add operation compared to GCC ARM. Again, that is something that we need to dig into. So other graph applications, I'll be done in five minutes. So other graph applications. So we tried several other graph applications from GAP, uh, as I said, and uh, red is better, blue is not. Uh, because of the loop restructuring, in some cases, we are kind of noticing, um, you know, performance degradations. And, uh, you know, some of the cases are outliers, which we don't understand why. So basically for graph 500, we noticed that there is not much of a performance improvement when we, um, you know, uh, uh, when we use explicit ZFIL, but on the other hand, if we use the compiler option and Fujitsu, uh, we see about 10% improvement. So compilers can win here. Um, so overall observation, so the graph neighborhood kern, uh, uh, benchmark, uh, it exhibits about two to five X performance degradation compared to stream. So stream is at one end and the graph analytics benchmark is at the other end, but you know, both of them, they actually show improvement. And um, uh, the Fujitsu on, uh, as I was saying, the Fujitsu on uh, the zero fill implicit, the compiler option uh, for graph 500 BFS demonstrated up, up to 17% improvement. And when we compared that with the explicit version, it was about like, you know, three to 11%. So compiler is, can really, you know, do more things here. And for real world, the more complicated applications, about five to 9% from gap 
uh, benchmarks. So overall, if you segregate between benchmarks and applications, we see that benchmarks are showing about 20 to 40 percent, 20 or 40 percent or up to 40 percent, depending on the graph benchmark or stream, uh, which is great. But applications, uh, we didn't try regular vectorizable applications. I bet they will be much more. Uh, but for graph applications, it was only about uh, 10 percent. So I would, uh, you know, so it the I, I think it's still good. We need to figure out why, uh, you know, what are the some of the corner cases. Uh, two more slides quickly. Uh, we noticed some performance variabilities for irregular workloads on Okami. This is the selfish detour benchmark. So you see the spikes and, uh, you know, this is something we need to study more. Um, and also the, we actually required a lot of L2 performance events. And we noticed that uh, between Okami and Fugaku, uh, there are notable differences. Although the kernels are slightly different, uh, it might be because of kernel, it might be because of uh, the architecture. I'm not sure exactly what, and we need to figure that out. Uh, so thanks a lot again for listening, and please get in touch with me if you have any questions or if you want to uh, you know, collaborate. I would have to leave in another 10, 15 minutes. So, and a big thanks to Eva and team for everything. Thank you. Any questions? Many, yeah, many thanks, Ryan. That was very interesting. Um, are there any questions? Otherwise, I'll, I'll just start with one because I'm curious about that. You, you thought that sometimes, or most of the time, you got pretty good, a pretty good performance improvement, but sometimes there's the performance degradation. Is there any way to see beforehand where CFIL um, is improving the performance and where not? I think so, because, uh, you know, I'll give you an example. It totally depends on the graph structure, right? So for some graphs, the degree might be, so degree means how many edges are connected to a vertex. It might be too less. It might be too less for Z fill to be applied. So there might be some overhead. So we can skip those vertices deliberately and uh, not actually uh, you know incur this overhead so we can easily do this by uh, sort of pre-processing by just getting to know the structure of the graph and then deciding which vertices we should skip so that way we can easily get rid of some of the issues i think that makes does that, sense. that yeah, yeah. That makes sense. thanks any other actually, questions you can trust on yeah go ahead so I have a question. So, uh, so in this like a uh, vertex uh, data structure, is it was just uh, like um, an uh, array of uh, basic uh, data types, like you know doubles, and then you just yeah uh, somewhere was having a neat list, mm -hmm. or it was like a a complete data structure like x y z v x v x and so on. So like because many of the codes will they use a data structure for individual vortexes and then you, you're going to have even more overhead for false uh, cache line and use false cache sharing line. right yeah i yeah that's a very good point it uh, so basically we used we altered the graph data structure a little bit so that everything is an array uh, so uh, for the benchmark everything is uh, an array of doubles okay does that make sense yeah yeah so maybe yeah. like you know that's why like you know I don't actually remember what what is used in the graph 500. It's probably more classic. Yeah. In place so of structures. Exactly. So for graph is also worse. Mm -hmm. So for graph 500, we actually you know updated a part of the code where the graph structure is not used. It is it is like plain array. That's why I said that there are some parts within, there are some regular parts within even graph analytics codes where, you know, adding ZFIL can help. Uh, they have this stream write pattern. So we did not change the part of graph analytics, which goes through the graph structure and uses the, you know, user structs, for instance. We just use like, you know, uh, places where it uses like straightforward arrays. And that's also a limitation in some way, because, you know, those portions, it may not um, may not be significant portions of the entire, uh, you know, application performance. Okay, thank you. Yeah.